This is part two of Read to Lead, Jeffrey Pfeffer's Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't. Welcome back. In a world of incompetent bosses, micromanagers, and petty tyrants, you are listening to The Leader Smith. Okay, chapter eight, he's talking about building a reputation. The study demonstrated, uh, he, he had studies, a number of studies here that demonstrated that um, if you're able to create a favorable first impression, you receive higher ratings and you're thought of differently than if you can't create a good first impression. Now, the scripture talks about good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than gold or silver. But it's not about impression management. It's about actually, you know, having that good name because you, you're a good man. So be that good person. Okay, uh, chapter nine, uh, overcoming opposition and setbacks. He talks about uh, there's, you know, and, and here there's some good advice. There really is some good advice about it. Don't cause yourself unnecessary problems. Don't take things personally. Be persistent. You got to keep going. You have to cope with setbacks. Don't give up. But then he gets to some kind of weird advice here. Like um, he's talking about seize the initiative. So if you realize that there's a power play and, you know, people are looking at your power and thinking about catch your, catch your opponents off guard, he says. He says, don't wait if you see a power struggle coming. While you are waiting, others are organizing, support, and orchestrating votes to win. It sounds ominous, but I, wait, I mean, why are you living in that world where you have to be dealing with power struggles like that? Is, is that really that important? Punish your enemies and reward your friends. But again, is that where you want to live? Chapter 10, he finally gets to the price of power. Uh, and this is the one chapter in the entire book that I really like. He talks about the costs of power. The first one is visibility and scrutiny. When you get to a position of power, you're in a fishbowl. Okay, that's legit. Number two, loss of autonomy. As you rise, you lose more and more control of your time and schedule. That's also legit. Cost three, the time and effort required. So it often costs the leader's personal life to, to be in charge, to be a leader. I mean, how many CEOs do we know that they got to the pinnacle of their profession, but it only cost them four wives along the way? So that's not necessarily where you want to be. You, I, I would rather have that balance, have that um, you know security of of what is the the priorities in life that make you actually happy and healthy, than to have just grabbed the brass ring, but it costed everything along the way. Trust dilemmas. Um, that's cost number four. So uh, you want your job, um, but so do other people. I mean, if you get to power more and more powerful positions, people will stab you in the back and they'll, you know, holding on to power will require you to be vigilant. And this is why people become controlling the higher and higher that they go. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Cost number five, power as an addictive drug. And he says, look, the day before your retirement, you're a powerful executive. The day after retirement, you have a normal human existence. Nobody's calling you anymore. And you're going through almost like a, a drug withdrawal. So, um, and it's difficult because, it, you know, your identity was in that. And this is why your identity should not be in your job. But your identity was wrapped around this. And there's a heightened risk of death after a job loss and the loss of one social role because people wrap their identity around that. So your identity shouldn't be found in your work itself. Okay, chapter 11, he talks about how and why people lose power. He says, power corrupts. It's mostly true. Hey, it's good admission. That's, that's right. Power does mostly corrupt. The powerful are more likely to try to take what they want from others. Okay, it's sad, but it's true. But because they have power and they're used to getting their way, they're more likely to do it. They're constantly flattered and so this is, again, why dictators are nuts. Think about this. The dictators, they're flattered. They're told what they want to hear because if they're not told what they want to hear, they go and destroy the people that don't, don't tell them what they want to hear. And then they're often left field because nobody's telling them truth anymore because they don't want to be sent off to Siberia or whatever the equivalent is in their organization. So Pfeffer says, power produces overconfidence and risk-taking insensitivity to others, stereotyping, and a tendency to see other people as a means to the power holder's gratification. That is, you're seeing people as objects. And when you start seeing people with, as objects, you treat them differently, you treat them badly. And so that's what tends to happen. 
And he cites a number of studies. The powerful, they tend to, to fail uh, to attend to others' needs. They pay less attention to those with less power. They become overconfident. They become less observant of others' needs. They become paranoid. And then they become, and then they trust, they rely much more heavily on a certain few trusted lieutenants. And then as they burn out, they become more consumed with controlling their power and more controlling. I mean, uh, more con consumed with they become more consumed with uh, holding on to their power, and as a consequence, they become more controlling. You can see this at various levels as people move up and up and up in power. So that's what really what's going on very often, and it's terrible because even if you win, you lose. And it makes me think of um, R. Scott Rodent, the steward leader, says exactly the opposite. Look, even if you win this game of be getting to the top, you're bound, you're in chains because you you're not free. Right? You have to constantly watch for other people. Or they, what are they going to do? So you are free when you don't need this power. That's when you're free. You are free when you hold it loosely. If, if God's given you this, um, this position to steward, you steward it well. You do it as, as well as you possibly can. But don't worry about, I have to hold on to it or, or else. Okay? Then you're a slave. So Because if you win at that game, you lose. So what you try to control will control you. And that's not where you want to be. Okay, back to the book, chapter 12, uh, power dynamics, good for you, good for organizations. <laughs> and he, he's truthful, organizational politics leads to reduced job satisfaction, it leads to reduced morale, reduced organizational commitment, higher intentions to leave. I mean, it's almost all bad things that power dynamics play. Power dynamics are a reality, we have to understand that they're there, but it leads to a lot of bad things. Pfeffer says this, quote, if organizations aren't worrying about you, and you can lose your job in a political struggle or on a whim, why should you worry about them? Reciprocity works both ways. And to some degree, I get his point, right? Like you, they want you to knock yourself out, but then at the same time, they're not necessarily going to uh, do right by you. And that's why good leadership is taking care of your people. But not all organizations are thinking that way. So I understand what he's saying. And, and he's then taking that message and saying, look, you need to just build your power base and protect yourself. I'm coming to it from a different perspective. The scripture says, whatever you do, do it uh, with all your heart as unto the Lord, not for human masters, and you'll receive your inheritance from the Lord. With that, though, not just the inheritance part, but if you're doing excellent work, you're a lot less likely to get cast off to the side as you're doing excellent work. So uh, I, I'm not gonna, going to say, oh, no, you got to build your power base. Um, it's good to know how that power base is built, but I, I'm not arguing that this is what you should do. Okay, chapter 13, it's easier than you think. Finally, he says, uh, identify your strengths and weaknesses. And this is all good advice. If you feel powerful, you will act powerful. Behave strategically toward those in power. Uh, do not play the victim. As you do, you give your power away. Or And, and if you don't even try to you know, reach for powerful or more powerful positions, you give your power away automatically. Okay, those are all legit. But then he says that people align with winners. And because of that, he wants you to be a winner, and then you'll have power, and then you'll have people following and aligning with you. That's the whole premise of his book, and it's terrible that that is what his conclusion tends to be. So that's that's the, a good summary of Pfeffer. Now, let me give you just a, a few final thoughts about Pfeffer before we're done. Pfeffer did a great job explaining what is, but he confuses um, is and ought. He doesn't even really talk about the difference between is and ought. He just says, this is a roadmap. Here's what is. Just follow this roadmap. The reality is that people get ahead by lying and cheating too, but you don't want to be that guy. Morality should inform reality. That is, your morality, how what the ought is, should inform what is is. So you could kiss up to the powerful, or you could care for those without power and really be a blessing to them. You could self-promote, or you could let others praise you for what you're already doing to do right. Okay? Your morality should have impact or it's worthless. And it's not moral to say that everybody does it. So, you know, that's, I mean, it just reminded me of uh, Warren Buffett's famous uh, memo. And perhaps I'll do that in the next episode. To his memo to his shareholders where he said, the five most dangerous words in business may be, everybody else is doing it. Okay, so the bottom line, the book is good in that it reveals what is, but it builds itself as this roadmap to power. Unfortunately, in confusing what is and what ought, you're, you're not getting where you're trying to go to. So what I mean by that is that without the ought, this could be a roadmap to greed, corruption, and even jail time. So you don't want to take this directly, what is or how people have gotten there as um, the way that you must do it. 
Okay, so today our quotation for contemplation is from Gandhi. Now, we've seen bumper stickers that say something like, be the change that you want to see, or something along those lines. And that's a short, truncated version of his actual quote. He didn't actually say that. What he did say was this, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies in our world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change toward him. We do not need to wait to see what others do. Okay, so that Gandhi is talking about be the ought, the change the is. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do as well. So it helps to understand how power works, but don't practice what Pfeffer preaches. Thanks.